they come at the end of sentences. Okay, 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 obviously that's not how my videos work. You might have forgotten given the long hiatus. The period is the culmination of the menstrual cycle when the uterine lining is flushed out through the vagina. But have you ever given much thought to how interesting it is? What's that? No, you haven't? Because my audience is 90% men? And that's uncomfortable? Well, buckle in, because menstruation is sweeping the nation, and you just got front row tickets. So, menstruation is actually a very complex process, and to discuss it, we first need to talk about reproductive cycles in general. In my biology videos, we usually start with mammals and go outwards, but when we're talking about reproductive anatomy, things tend to get more complex the closer we get to mammals. So we'll build it up, okay? Let's start with sponges. They reproduce asexually. It's kind of a peaceful existence, right? <sighs> a second, smaller sponge grows, and then eventually buds off. Alright, this is boring, let's have sex. So in the animal kingdom, there are two kinds of sexual organs, or gonads, the ones that make the small guys and the ones that make the big guys. You need a big guy and a small guy to touch to make a baby. It's more complicated than that, but I'm trying not to retread. This video is entirely about how the gametes get out of the gonads. So comb jellies are the closest we have to original sex havers, very basic. Each comb jelly has both gonads, and once they reach a certain age, they just kind of spray them out all the time. That's about it. If they run out of food, they'll stop doing it. But other than that, just whenever. Placozoans don't have sex again. Okay, guys, can we, can we focus? Jellyfish are complicated. The polyps reproduce asexually, so we can ignore them, but the medusa reproduce sexually. Cnidarians are very diverse, but so are most clades. That's why I'm using case studies. The man of war is dioecious, so they need to release gametes into the water at the same time. Otherwise, the chance of them meeting would be scarce. Generally, jellyfish try to gather in a place with a bunch of nutrients. Then, if there's enough light at dusk or dawn, they all release them at the same time. Hopefully, enough of them meet to spawn a new crop of jellyfish. If something needs to be synchronized by seas, it's nearly always dependent on photo period, the amount of time the sun is visible each day. It's time for the star of the show. Yeah, yes, I know we're skipping over them. We'll get back to them. It's time for the star of the show, the sea urchin. Like jellyfish, sea urchins spawn instead of mating, where they spray out a bunch of gonads and let them meet on their own. Unlike jellyfish, they have a lot more control over this process. They're triggered to produce gametes by lesser sunlight during the winter, but they don't release them until the summer. They congregate together, and although like jellyfish, they can release based on environmental triggers like abundance of food and ideal temperatures, they can also coordinate the release with chemical signals. Another thing that can trigger spawning is stress. From an evolutionary standpoint, a life without mating is an entire lifetime wasted. I learned that one from incel forums. So, if you think you might die, usually during a storm or when injected with potassium chloride, you might as well spray out all the gametes in case you get lucky. This evolution isn't really going to be developed upon because everyone else tends to focus on mating rather than spawning. Lampreys technically spawn, but it's weird. I can't get into too much detail because most of the literature is strangely erotic. Jeez, should I censor this? Essentially, the gist is, lampreys do spawn, but they need to have sex to stimulate the release of gametes. To answer the lampreys, that means arousal is what leads to the release of gametes. And in males, that's how it stayed all the way up until humans. In every clade in between, you get sperm out of a male by pleasuring them. Which is why the remainder of this video will focus on how to get eggs out of a female, a process called ovulation. But the lamprey's middle ground leads to a bizarre mixture of the characteristics of mating and spawning, so let's touch on that. So lampreys are semiparous, meaning they only give birth once, hence the name. You know, Latin is a very useful language in biology. Point being, despite this, they're still polygonandrists. You know what that means, fish orgy. The lampreys have a giant sex pile until they all die from exertion, or the cuts they've inflicted by attaching to each other and mating. Jumping back to protostomes, there's a massive distinction now. Instead of constantly producing eggs, females are now born with a certain number of eggs and are limited by how many they can release. Why? Well, as DNA is replicated over an animal's lifespan, it can quickly become mutated and aberrant. Producing all potential offspring as close to conception as possible greatly reduces mutation. Octopi are pretty similar to lampreys. They are semiparous, but they mate monogamously, and they mate instead of spawning. Although this process isn't taxing, they remain semiparous because the female protects her eggs valiantly after laying them, and has to eat both sexual partners to do so. Which is so beta, right? Too weak to spray out kids and then abandon them? What are you, a freaking vertebrate? Show some spine. No, the opposite of that. Shut up. 
After the sperm arrives in the reproductive system, the female releases all of her eggs at once and then dies right before they hatch. In some species, mating is caused because of the greater sunlight during the summer, but it's always the mating that causes ovulation. It's a bit better understood in arthropods. Generally speaking, the insect reproductive system goes entryway, ovaries, place in the middle, spermatheca. Spiders have two entryways, and the spermathecas are entryways. So, what is a spermatheca? Well, insects and spiders can be fertilized by a male weeks before they're ready to lay eggs. Also, they likely want to weigh all of their options first. So, they hold sperm in the spermatheca, and if a better male comes along, they replace it. If none does, they release the sperm and fertilize their eggs. So, what triggers them to release the eggs? Generally, the presence of sperm and certain related proteins and the pheromones a male releases during mating trigger the release of eggs. There's a key reversal in sharks. Again, the females are fertilized prior to the release of eggs, but they don't have a spermatheca. The sperm just lies in the oviducts, dangerously close to the eggs. Is no one else concerned about this? But it's not the mating that stimulates ovulation. Rather, it's caused by the increasing photoperiod of summer. In some species, mating occurs during the winter, and eggs aren't fertilized until June. There's a notable benefit to this, because now the females will always be pregnant at the most effective time. Though there is a dark side. UNFERTILIZED EGGS! If ovulation is no longer dependent on the presence of sperm post-mating, then it could still happen when there's no sperm to fertilize, resulting in wasted eggs. And remember, you only have so many. Uh, granted, it is upwards of 10,000, but every potential child counts. I learned that one from pro-life ads. So if you could find a way to synchronize both, for eggs to be only released when they can be fertilized, and only when environmental conditions are met, then that would clearly be the ringer. So let's move over to fish. Now, teleos fish are, by all accounts, the most diverse group at this level to the extent that that makes sense. Point being, this section will use vague language. Like lamprey, all fish spawn externally, but generally have, if not sex, they have complicated mating rituals preceding the release of gametes that typically shower each other with enough pheromones. But lampreys don't begin spawning until they head upstream, following the pheromones released by the next generation. Many fish don't swim upstream, and even the ones that do are much more flexible. In terms of mating, I should say. They have a bony skeleton. But that means they don't need to bite each other to mate. Point being, most fish release gametes based on mating, but the mating is in turn triggered by certain environmental conditions being met, a period of time that would be called mating season. If the condition in question is photoperiod, then mating is predictable and called seasonal breeding. If the condition in question is something else, it's unpredictable and called opportunistic breeding. This concept is very much in motion in tetrapods, but there's a key change. Instead of having mating trigger ovulation, ovulation is now directly linked to the environment, or rather via hormones. Hormones that also cause an increase in sex drive. This is exactly what we wanted, right? Well, not quite. If you're completely dependent on external factors, then with a seasonal cycle, you can only mate once a year. With an opportunistic pattern, you could potentially go multiple years without mating. That's not so big a problem with fish, where one spawning is 40,000 potential babies, but with birds, lizard, mammals, you need what we in the business call gonadal recrudescence. Environmental conditions don't exactly trigger hormones, but rather kickstarts and then eventually ends hormone cycles. In mammals, pregnancy can also end it early, for obvious reasons. So you might be a little myth that I keep throwing around the word hormones. Let's get specific. This process is very much still the one that works in humans. Once you reach puberty, your hypothalamus produces GnRH, which leads to the production of FSH and LH in your anterior pituitary. FSH is what actually causes your ovaries to release eggs, but LH causes your ovaries to produce estrogen. More estrogen then causes more GnRH, and eventually it all spirals upwards until ovulation. Now, you might be asking yourself, can you please stop referring to everything as my ovaries? Yes, okay, but all of my sources did that, and my job is to distill into you three days of research into a single 10 minute video. So just try to put yourself in my shoes, or actually a woman's shoes. And if you do have ovaries, you could have skipped this section. Estrogen spikes during ovulation, which leads to a giant sex drive, what we call being in heat if you're a furry, or in estrus if you're a scientist. All this estrogen, of course, also causes the GnRH secretion in the brain to decrease. That, in turn, causes LH to decrease, and ultimately estrogen drops as well. It's during this lull in hormones that menstruation lies. Now, you may be asking yourself, did- didn't- wait, hold on, I thought estrogen made GnRH increase, now it makes it decrease? Which is a good question. Um. Uh, 
Um, it's confusing. So the GnRH neurons themselves can't actually respond to estrogen. They don't have the proper receptors. So estrogen is attaching to somewhere else in the brain, which is then eventually resulting in GnRH production. The switch then must be occurring during the in-between step. And the problem is that we don't know what this step is. Recently, we think it might involve kiss peptides, but we don't really know how those work and how they would switch it. Point being, it just kind of switches after ovulation. Hormones lull and eventually reach an adir, and the cycle resets. Most animals do not menstruate. It's a very recent evolution in only a few mammals. So why? Why do we do it? Hello to everyone who just dropped in for this section. Well, you might notice that humans menstruate constantly instead of just during a mating season. That should mean lots of unfertilized eggs, right? Well, humans, like most of the side of the tree, went in pretty hard on a quality over quantity idea. In spawning animals, they might end up going through that massive pool of eggs because they need 40,000 babies just to get one adult. But even if humans ovulated literally every day, they would barely make it through a fraction of their eggs. It simply stopped being an issue. It also means that humans focus very intensively on a single child, even more so than other mammals. Case in point, you can literally only breastfeed up to two children at once. So, instead of being compelled to breed yearly, your uterus is open whenever, and it's up to you to decide. That means two things that lead to menstruation. One, we don't lose all that much by not being able to get pregnant some of the time, and two, the baby has a massive placenta. And I mean massive. The baby is basically spoiled in the womb. The placenta can even plug directly into the mother's bloodstream. That means two things. The uterine lining needs to be strong enough to support that placenta, and it needs to include deciduous cells, which can destroy an undesirable embryo before it gets out of hand. All this means a very energy-intensive uterine lining, which is therefore much more efficient to flush out and destroy every month instead of maintaining. So, like most animals, human females experience ovulation at the maximum hormones, but then they also experience menstruation at the minimum hormones. But when the hormones are dropping, it can lead to pain and other symptoms in the body, collectively called PMS. Also, there's something called Mittelschmerz, where they experience pain during ovulation. You know, I'm beginning to think women have to go through kind of a lot.